Anna? No, can you, am I? <laughs> I, I, I was, I was just telling you, yes, we could see your screen. Oh, great. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even know about that feature, so. Yeah, we can all, we can all do that. All you have to do is bring down the view options and um, click on annotate. Oh, the annotate button. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> it's very, it's a very cool feature. I like I learn something new on Zoom every day. Um, all right, you guys. Well, thank you for joining our second uh, food revolution discussion. Um, last week or two weeks ago, we talked about food insecurity and uh, a couple different issues surrounding that. So if you wanted to rewatch something or check out any resources, we do have that in our Google Classroom. Um, today we have with us Amelia Litz. She is a PhD candidate. Uh, from Northwestern University, and she studies, oh gosh, I always want to say, this is embarrassing, this is my sister, but <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she studies plant biology and conservation, um, and within that, she does a lot with pollinators, so we invited her to talk to us today and kind of answer some questions we might have and just share a little bit with us more about the pollinator community. Um, so if you guys have questions as we go, please feel free to type them in the chat or speak up. Um, I'll do my best to uh, navigate answering those. And then also, Amelia, forgive me if I, if I chime in and interrupt you with questions, if that's all right. Um, that's totally fine. That's totally, okay, cool. All right, well, let's get going. Welcome, Melly, Amelia. Thank you, it's, I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions throughout, just either type it in the chat and Anna will let me know because I can't see the chat right now um, or just unmute yourself. Um, it's not a super strict presentation, um, but my name is Amelia um, and I'm a PhD candidate. And what that really means is I'm just halfway done with getting my PhD. Um, and I work at three different places, and the first one is Northwestern University. That's the school I'm associated with, um, but my office and where I work is the Chicago Botanic Garden, um, and then in the summer, when I'm not in Chicago, I do all my research at the Rocky Mountain Biological Station in Colorado, and this picture is actually my favorite view from one of my field sites, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and what my job as a field ecologist looks like. Um, and then we will talk about pollinator diversity. All right, so I grew up in South Dakota with Anna, she was my sister, um, and I really didn't think plants or insects were very interesting, but I took an environmental science class and I became very interested in the environment. And after high school, I moved to Thousand Oaks, so pretty nearby where you guys are at, um, and I just started volunteering with any organization that I could find that had any relation to the environment. And the one that really stuck was called Tree People. And some of you may have heard of Tree People or volunteered with them. And if you haven't, I highly recommend doing it because they work right in the Santa Monica Mountains, so it's not too far away. Um, but they'll go out every weekend or sometimes during the weekdays and they'll either go into people's neighborhoods or out into like a park like Malibu Creek State Park and they'll do native plantings. Um, so I did that for like three years every weekend and I was like, oh, I want to do this forever. I want to work with plants, um, but I had to get a degree. So I went to school in Northern California at Humboldt State University. And if any of you really like to be outside and are at all interested in uh, studying environmental science, I highly recommend this school because as you can see from the pictures, most of my classes were outside. You're right in the heart of the redwoods and there's just a lot of field-based classes. So it's very fun. And while I was there, sorry, I took a class in pollination biology. Um, and for this class, we had to do pollination observations. And what you do for that, uh, you pretty much just stare at a flower or a flower patch for certain periods of time and you record if an insect comes to pollinate it. And we did this for an hour. And while I was staring at flowers for this hour, I just thought to myself, oh my gosh, if I go into research, staring at flowers could be a part of my job. 
And so then I did like everything in my power to become a researcher. And so then I applied for a special program for undergraduate students and it's called a research experience for undergraduates. And I was selected to do a summer of research in Virginia. So I did this at the State Arboretum of Virginia, which is essentially just like an outside museum for all the trees that could potentially grow in the state. Um, but I got to work on bees. Um, and I worked on these little bees called uh, alfalfa leafcutter bees. And they're a solitary nesting species, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but we were looking at the effect of pesticides on this specific species. So that was a lot of fun. And after that, I applied to the PhD program at the Chicago Botanic Garden and Northwestern and I got in. So here I am now, this is where I work. Uh, again, like I said, my office is at the Chicago Botanic Garden. So it's really nice on breaks and stuff. I can walk around the beautiful garden and I work in this really cool building called the Plant Science Center. And I know you guys live really far away, but if you're ever in Chicago and you're at the Chicago Botanic Garden, you can come to the Plant Science Center and you can look into any of the labs because they're all like covered in windows, like the picture on the upper right hand corner. So you can like actually see all of us doing our work throughout the day. So when I'm not at the Chicago Botanic Garden, I'm collecting data at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. And this is kind of a weird place. It's like way up in the mountains and it's in an old mining town. So there's all these like weird little wooden cabins and scientists from all over the world come here every summer to do their research. Um, so that's a lot of fun because I get to meet a lot of new people and everyone's so excited about ecology and doing research. So the first step is getting there and my research question involves snowmelt. So I study a really, really early emerging species. Um, so I have to get out to my field station um, really early and the road isn't cleared. So I often have to snowshoe in. And once you're there and once the snow melts, you have to set up your sites. So my setup is right here on the bottom left hand corner. And what I'm essentially doing is I have all these tents up and they catch insects when they come out of the ground. And it allows me to see the exact day that they come out of the ground. Um, but you know, if you're interested in ecology, you can do like a lot of different kinds of setups. Like the setup on the right is really, really fancy equipment that's very expensive, so expensive that they had to put an umbrella over it to protect it. Uh, but if you wanted to do really simple ecology research up in the left hand corner, um, this is my friend Rachel and all she has to do is show up to her sites and bring an insect net. So once you set up your sites, um, you might be collecting insects, you might be looking at the insects that come out of the ground. Here are two of my friends and they're just counting flowers. So that's what their research is. And you run into all sorts of cool stuff in the field. Um, on the left is an alien head looking thistle. So some weird mutant plant. Um, the one in the middle, my friend ran into some wild horses all out in the field. And Ooh. there's all sorts of cool stuff. Um, my friend found a little salamander. That was a fun day. And just last year, uh, my friend actually had to climb a tree during her field work and wait 45 minutes for a moose to leave her field site. So all sorts of stuff that happened. <laughs> and all, all sorts of roadblocks too, like uh, you might get a flat tire out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, so be sure you know how to change a tire. Or uh, like what happened to me, my, my trap got trampled by some wild animal in the night, so I had, to, I had to fix that and it sent me back like two days. But some things go right, and at the end of the field season, you might have some physical collections. So on the left here is a pinned bee collection that I had. Um, and on the right is a bunch of pressed plants. Um, but you might not have collections either. You may have just um, done observations um, or you're collecting like climate data with data loggers or something like that. So this field station, um, a lot of people study a lot of different things related to ecology, but it's actually most popular and most well known for its research done on pollinators. So we'll talk about pollinators a bit. So I'm kind of assuming if you came here today, you are aware that most flowers need a pollinator. And that just means it needs some animal that can move quickly or fly. And it needs this animal to transfer pollen from one flower to another. 
So I'm kind of curious um, what animals you guys think pollinate flowers. So you can either put it in the chat or unmute yourself. We're getting a lot of uh, D, Bs, all of them. Yeah, so it is true. All of them pollinate flowers. Um, and I'll kind of go into some pictures here. So I'm sure you're all familiar with hummingbirds as pollinators, but there's actually all sorts of birds that pollinate flowers. Some of them that you wouldn't really expect to, like this uh, warbler up in the corner, but we also have like the nice hummingbird in the bottom there. And then surprisingly, there are a lot of mammals that pollinate flowers. You might know bats pollinate flowers, but also a lot of different like pollen and rodent species. And they're actually really great pollinators because they're very fluffy, which makes them very messy. And so they transfer a lot of pollen. And then there are tons of different insects that pollinate flowers. Like here on the left, we have some cool looking flies. There are a lot of beetle pollinators, and of course you guys are totally aware of moths. I mean butterflies, sorry. I was already on the next slide because I was about to talk about moths because I think they're really cool. Um, so a really big and diverse group of pollinators are moths, and you might think of moths as just drab little creatures that bang against your porch light all night, but they're actually an incredibly diverse group of insects. Um, and some of them are even highly specialized to certain flowers. So this kind of middle picture on the bottom shows it a little bit, but there are some moths that have ridiculously long tongues. Like they can be like three times the length of their body. Um, and they're used to like be very specialized pollinators on some flowers. Uh, but what I'm mostly going to talk about today are bees, uh, not only because what I, they're what I study, but they're also the most effective and diverse pollinators. Um, but first, I will kind of want to ask you guys some questions about what you think of bees. So do you guys think that all bees make honey? We have a yes question mark. We have a no, don't. no question mark, no. No, but <laughs> females, honeybees. I like all right. the question marks. This is good. Yeah, I appreciate all of the question marks. Um, so actually only two types of bees make honey. Um, it's the well-known honeybees as the name would imply, but also some stingless bees of the tropics. Um, and those are kind of the only two types of bees that make honey. So I'll kind of talk about what the other ones are doing, but they're not making honey. Uh, and then second, do you guys think that all bees live in colonies or hives? We got a solid nope. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I would assume so. Maybe not anymore. Get some yeses. She, someone said, I thought so, but I'm thinking no. <laughs> so. Well, I'm, I'm glad that they're, they're thinking no now. So we know the most about bees that live in colonies and hives because honeybees live in hives. And we know so much about honeybees. And we also know a lot about bumblebees. And bumblebees live in colonies. But most bee species actually live alone. And they're called solitary nesting bees. And they have this weird life where they live in little cavities in trees or hollowed out stems. And a lot of them actually live underground. So here we have one in, in some wood. And this is kind of what the nest looks like. So this, this, this nest was all made by one female. Um, and that, and then after she makes that, she's like done. She goes, she goes and dies. She's done for the season. Same, same with this cutie that lives underground. The female doesn't stick around. She doesn't like meet her young and they don't really like work as a team or work with each other or anything like that. So in fact, there are 20,000 bee species in the world and more than 75% live solitary lives. And the ones that live in colonies, like we're familiar with, only make up like 10% of that of the bee species. So it's a really small percentage that live in colonies. So this means there are like 15,000 bee species that come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And as you can see in this picture, most of these don't really look like what a bee looks like. So 
how do you know if you're looking at a bee? Because I mean, if I didn't study bees my whole life, if one of these came and flied around, I, I definitely wouldn't think it was a bee. Um, I would probably think it was a fly. Um, but I'll teach you guys a really quick way to tell the difference between a bee and a fly. And then when you're out and about, you'll probably see a lot more bees. So this is a picture of a bee and it's kind of what you expect a bee to look like. But if you'll notice, it has two wings on each side. So there's four wings total. And then its antenna are kind of spaced out and they're kind of like hang down, they're long. And here's a picture of a fly. And this doesn't always hold true, but their eyes are way buggier and they just kind of look crazy. Um, but they only have two wings. So they have or one set of wings. So they have two wings total. And their antenna are like either really hard to see, kind of like in this picture, or they're really close together. So they don't have that space like the bee does. So the bee has two sets of wings and spaced out antenna, and the fly has one set of wings and really close together antenna. So now I'm gonna show you guys some pictures and we're gonna start off pretty easy and you'll just tell me bee or fly to see uh, if you can kinda tell if it's a bee or a fly on the wing. All right, here's the first picture. Is it a bee or a fly? We got a lot of bee answers. Pretty, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bee. It's pretty, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, that one came flying up. I, I would assume it was a bee. Good job. What about this one? Got some crazy colors. Um, B fly B, the two sets of wings. So B? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Perfect. Yeah, that's, it's kind of almost hard to see, but you can see one wing here and then the big one here. So it has two sets of wings. So it's a bee. You can also kind of see its antenna, but it's actually a parasitic bee. So they're pretty neat. What about this one? <laughs> <laughs> we got an eel fly. But <laughs> fly, fly. <laughs> yep. Yep. You guys are good at eating flies. <laughs> All right, what about this cutie? We got bees. Yes, because it's adorable. <laughs> All right, these next, these next three are gonna be a little harder. Ooh. All right, Zoe says fly. We're getting a lot of flies. Fly that looks like a bee. Bee question mark, bee. Yeah, so this is, this is a, a bee mimic, but it's a fly because you can only see the one set of wings. So, so yeah, there are actually a lot of crazy looking flies out there that look a lot like bees. All right, what about this one? Ooh, that's pretty. A little bee, 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 bee. Good, you guys are great at this. Yeah, <laughs> it totally is. It is an adorable bee. There's a lot of, the, bees like this are commonly called sweat bees. Um, and sometimes they'll come on a hot day in the summer and lick sweat off of you. What? It's adorable, it kind of tickles. Anyway, what about this one? Uh, fly. Nice, you guys were not fooled. A lot of flies. Yeah, one set of wings. It's got those weird antenna. This is a really good example of uh, a bee fly. It's actually a fly, but it tries to look like a bee. Nice work. All right, so now we've established that there are a lot of different kinds of bees and a lot of different kinds of pollinators, um, but why is that important? It's important because not all pollinators work the same way, and some flowers might require a very specialized pollinator in order to make seed seeds and fruits. So for example, the bumblebee on the left is capable of something called buzz pollination, um, which means the bee will buzz at a perfect rate in order for the flower to release pollen. And the flower will not release the pollen unless it's vibrated at this exact rate. And honeybees can't do this. So if we totally just rely on honeybees and no other bees, we can't pollinate things like blueberries or tomatoes, which do require buzz pollination. 
Um, and if you remember back to when I was talking about moths, um, some flowers need pollinators with these crazy long tongues. If you look at that picture, that it, it's, it's, an, it's incredible to see. I had a video, but it wasn't working. I highly recommend looking it up. Um, and then down here we have these orchid bees and in tropical areas, orchids are so diverse and that um, has a lot to do with the specialized pollination of orchid bees which I also highly recommend looking up because they are the craziest colors. Amelia. Yeah. That last one with the thing with the tongue, does it like yeah. shoot out and then stay there? Or does it like, like shoot out back? And oh, no. How's that so, work? so it will, yeah, no, that, so it's tongue will come out and it'll kind of like zero in on the flower and the entire tongue will go in the flower. So, so the actual nectar is at the bottom of a flower with, with a kind of tube that's, that's as long as the bee's tongue. That's it's, exactly. it's wild. <laughs> yeah, the moths are cool. Um, so if you want to help bees and all the other pollinators, like what can you do? Um, the first is to plant flowers. So the more diverse the flowers are, the better. Um, and it's also important to have flowers blooming all the time, especially in the spring and summer when most bees are out. So, so we want a lot of different kinds of flowers and we want flowers blooming all the time. And then you can also create habitat. So I always like to say a messy garden is a happy garden um, because bumblebees like to nest in kind of like really weird places like old, old mice nests and shallow holes in the ground or under like piles of sticks. So if you have little messes in your garden, that actually makes amazing habitat for bees. Um, also, because there's so many bees that nest in soil, some kind of bare dirt patches with pebbles, like in this picture, are really perfect for ground nesting bees. And for the ones that nest in cavities, I'm sure you guys have seen these like bee homes. So you can actually buy them at, at a lot of stores now. Um, yeah, so there's tons of stuff you can do. Um, question from the chat. Does beekeeping at your home help the bee population? That is a really great question. I'm glad you asked. And I'm just going to go ahead and put this slide up since we're on questions now. Um, so um, not really um, because the, the honeybee is a European honeybee. So it's actually an invasive species. Um, and because they're in such large numbers when they're in the colonies, um, they can actually outcompete native bees. So honeybees definitely have their place, like in agricultural settings when you are totally relying on like a lot of bees to do a lot of pollination all at once, honeybees are great for that. And you can move them around so you can, you can manage them. But as far as just like in your neighborhood or for like local gardens, um, they actually can be more detrimental um, to the native pollinator community than actually helping it. We also have another question. Do ground nesting bees live in SoCal or Ventura County? Yes. Um, sorry, I opened the chat too. Um, they live everywhere. So, so they're on all continents. Um, they definitely live in Southern California and all over Ventura County. There are a lot of species. So remember back to that slide, there's like over 75% of bee species are ground nesting species. So yes, they're in every ecosystem and you can find them anywhere if you if you if you know where to look. Uh, sorry, I just saw a comment in the in the box. Um, I bet you have seen them at your school because a lot of the times um, the nicely kind of uh, kept areas where where it's grass, but then there's some kind of dirt patch are really, really great for ground nesting bees. So that's actually really common that they're in that they're in fields. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, Ground hornets are scary, but ground nesting bees are not. They're, they're very non-aggressive. They're only going to sting you if you like step on them. What is the difference between bees and hornets? Um, sure. So, so like hornets and wasps um, are, the way I like to, I've, so, so bees evolved from hornets and wasps. So they're very closely related. Um, do you can view bees as like the vegetarian version of a wasp or a hornet. So wasps and hornets, there are a few species that pollinate, but generally they eat like dead insects. So, so they're like meat eaters and they don't pollinate. Um, and a lot of them live in like colonies and are social. Um, 
Yes. Sorry, I'm like going in the chat now. But yeah, so so if something lives in a colony, it's 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 more prone to sting you because it has this colony to protect. But solitary nesting species don't have a colony, so they have a lot less to protect and they're not as aggressive. Um, so the stinging multiple times, it kind of just depends on their on their biology. So um, the the stinger is actually a modified egg lane device. Um, so that's why it's like attached to their guts. And if the stinger gets stuck, then, then it rips out their guts, like in honeybees, I'm sure you've heard. Um, but, but some insects have like evolved for their guts not to be ripped out or for the stinger not to stay in. And that, that's how they can sting you more than once is if their stinger doesn't get ripped out. So, and can you talk about, um, cause I'm very curious, like that, like the evolution of bees as pollinators with certain plants, like are certain plants the way they are due to the pollinators or the plants or vice versa, like chicken or egg kind of thing? Well, it's, it's a very complicated question, but yet yeah, generally there is this like beautiful story of like, you know, plants really needed pollinators and pollinators really needed plants. So they kind of evolved to accommodate one another. And that's how bees are so diverse and how pollinate or how flowers are so diverse. Um, but the reason that we see such diversity is because you have these different, you, you can think of the bee as, as, as putting pressure on the plant to be a certain way, right? And so the plant evolves to accommodate for the bee because it likes the bee. But there are also things that it's selecting against. So like an herbivore that's eating the plant, the plant also has to evolve to deter that. So while pollinators do play a really important role of making flowers the way they are, there's a lot of other things that are making flowers the way they are too. Um, I don't know if there's, um, a way to, for a bee to remove. So there is, so some bees have evolved a way to sting without like getting its guts ripped out. But I, I don't know of a way where, where you would be able to help a bee that is stinging you remove its stinger. I think if it's going to get ripped out, it's going to get ripped out because that's, that's how the bee evolved. But Generally, you're not going to get stung by by a native bee. <laughs> um, oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, so they have something like a nose. Um, they they can they can sense smell, um, be, and that's the reason flowers smell good, right? Is because bees use um, scent as a cue to to flower. So. Well, it I'm responding to Alex's question in the chat about um, bees on the ground by your house that looked like they couldn't fly and were tired. Um, so they were honeybees. So there are a lot of complicated things going on with honeybees right now. Um, and in addition, there are a lot of factors that make it really hard for them to live. Um, yeah. Okay. Bye, Emily. Um, so it could be a combination of things. Um, pesticides are known to slow bees down. Um, sometimes if it's too hot out, they can't really function. Or if it's too cold out, they're going to be really slow. So they only fly during this kind of like optimal temperature. And then also like, uh, so you know, honeybees have kind of a lot of, a lot of different roles and some of it within the colony and the ones that are out foraging, their entire life's purpose is to just forage. So they might have just been at the end of the road and, and have, have been dying, which, which, which is what they were supposed to do because they're the foraging bees, if that makes sense. So like their job was done. <laughs> I have another question and I already, we already chatted a couple of times about it today, which was the strawberry fruit dilemma um, where a student yesterday in a class that Ms. Jackson was teaching, the strawberry had grown 
like two strawberries and then in the center of it was the leaves. And so we were curious, like, was that a pollination issue or, or anything like that? Yeah, so that's not actually going to be um, something to do with the pollination. So that's going to have to do with the mutation in the plant ovary development. So if it gets like too much pollen or too little pollen, it's not really like there's no pattern that we see between the amount of pollen and if a fruit is conjoined um but that has been loosely linked to stressors so it could be like it's too hot out or i didn't get enough water but i haven't seen too much too, i haven't seen too many people studying what causes conjoined fruit but it is just a mutation in ovary development <laughs> We have a question that says, I've seen bees at the beach before near the shores where there aren't really any plants. Is that normal? Yeah, so a lot of bees nest in the sand. Um, one of the bees that I'm studying for my dissertation actually nests in sand. Um, and they like it kind of moist because if you think about when you're digging in the dirt, if it's really dry, it's crumbling and you're not going to be able to make things. Um, but if it's kind of a little bit moist, so if you're close to water, it's going to be a lot easier to dig in it and make a nest. So yeah, lots of bees nest in the sand. Yeah, they're really cool bees. <laughs> There's this one bee up in Humboldt where I went to school and it nests like almost three feet down in the sand. It's, it's crazy. It's huge too. <laughs> Does it like find a like a pre-made neck like a, like a nest? I would do it. <laughs> It actually digs it. A lot of bees have special modifications for digging in, in soil or sand. Um, Ms. Thee has a question. Are bees decreasing in number? If so, why? That's a really good question, and it's also really hard to answer. So a lot of the bee decline worries are coming from honeybees, but it's not so much that honeybees are declining, but honeybees are becoming more difficult to manage. So there's all these like kind of confounding factors that makes it harder to keep bees. But as far as wild bee populations, we, we don't know enough about them um, to really say whether most bees are declining or not, but we are seeing a lot of declines with a lot of insects. And we also do know that bumblebees are declining. So to kind of wrap up the answer to that question, we do see for sure that some species of bumblebees are declining and we don't quite know why. Um, but as far as wild bee species go, um, they might be declining, but we just don't know enough about them to say that for sure or not. That's a really good question. Um, so Alex asks, is there anything we can do to help the native bee population besides planting more flowers? Um, and yes, it would be to create more habitat for them. So you can plant flowers all day, but if they don't have a place to go and make their nest, um, it's not really helping anything. So again, if you keep a messier garden, so you don't like clean up everything, there's kind of some like old reeds or you make like a bee home, um, and you create some habitat for them, that will do a lot in helping native bee populations. And also if you just like really want bees in your yard and you, and you don't wanna keep honeybees, you can order some solitary nesting bees online too. I would just Google in your area to, area to make sure they're already naturalized. <laughs> what does naturalized mean? Um, that's a, So you've heard, uh, Naturalized means that they're not an invasive species that is causing harm, but they're not native to the area. So they're not native, but they're not taking over or causing harm. Um, so bumblebees, uh, Abigail asked if bumblebees are the same thing as honeybees, and they're not. Um, so bumblebees and honeybees are very different. Um, they both live in colonies, but bumblebees are a lot bigger and a lot fluffier and we have native bumblebees here in America where we don't have native honeybees here in America. So all honeybees are invasive, but we have native bumblebees. And bumblebees can do that buzz pollination thing that I talked about earlier. Okay, so Alex said, 
Did you like insects and bees before you started studying them or did you start to like them as you studied them? I really liked plants, but I thought insects were super lame and boring. Um, and when I started liking them was when I started studying bees because they're adorable and so cute and so fun to study. Um, so so it, it really was just the, the cute factor of bees that kind of led to a love of all insects. <laughs> Adorably. Yes, they are. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, are killer invasive bees still a problem? So they're, they're as big of a, as a problem as any kind of invasive, invasive bees are. Uh, so, so they're not like taking over anything like, like, you know, if murder hornets were to come here, they wouldn't, they wouldn't cause damage on that scale. But, so they're still a problem, but they're not like this overwhelming kind of wave of a problem. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> and if you've already um, discussed this, I apologize. But I'm wondering if you think, in your opinion, like the bigger kind of threat to bees is, 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 is climate change like a threat to bees? Or is it just um, pesticides like you were talking about? Um, yeah, that's something else altogether. What do you yeah. think? That's a really good question. Um, so I actually study the effect of climate change on bees. So I'm a little biased in saying that, yes, of course, climate change affect, affects bees. Um, but really what it is, it's, it's all of them combined. So bees might be fine if it was just climate change. Bees might be fine if it was just pesticides. Bees might be fine if it was just like, you know, a bunch of buildings being built and, and urbanization. But because we have urbanization, so their habitat is kind of becoming piecier, and we have pesticides, which is making them slower and groggier, and we have climate change, so it's getting hotter, all of those things together is, is what's harming them. So it's definitely not just one thing. Mrs. Thee says, if she wants to increase pollination in her backyard, what should she do? Yes, um, plant native flowers and, and, and don't worry too much about making your garden perfectly clean so you can create some habitat for the bees. I was, I met, um, I think it was at, when we go to the Ventura County Fair, we have an ag booth. And um, I know that the bee industry in Ojai was like really damaged during our fires. Um, and so the few like beekeepers to our left, it's been good for them business wise because they, um, they go to like each of, if just for the students for fun, like they go to each of the farms and they bring their, um, their hive set up. So that way like bees will come and fertilize the crops. Um, am I explaining that properly, do you think? <laughs> Yeah, so so like farmers will will bring their bees to where? Sorry. Well, they like pay for, and I didn't know this myself, but like different farms will actually hire like a beekeeper to come and set up a hive like on their farm. Um, so because I think bees don't occur naturally, right? Yeah. So that they're kind of like trying to entice them to come. Um. Well, so by bringing honeybees, you're not like enticing native bees to come. Um, oh, like the opposite would be true. Um, they would like outcompete native bees. But if you have like a farm and, and your crops aren't being pollinated because native pollinators just can't nest there anyways, yes, honeybees are super essential for that. So, so they fill this gap when, you know, the, the farming practices have kind of created this, this system where, where native bees don't want to be anymore. Um, and they do, honeybees do a great job of filling in that gap. Um, but if you do things like adding hedgerows and making sure that there's crops throughout the entire growing season and make sure that like you're not doing too much tilling and leaving like some areas where native bees can nest, um, then you will have native bees. But, but like, yeah, honeybees wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily like attract native bees to come. Okay. Interesting. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> more questions. What part of Europe are honeybees from? I don't know. 
I know that I just know that they're the European honeybee. Um, I, 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 I have no idea where in Europe they're from. Um, and then Mrs. Thee wants to know, should she buy natural solitary bees? I would say yes. Um, yeah, so, so I would do like a quick Google. So, so the ones you can buy online um, are probably like the alfalfa leafcutter bee and uh, the blue orchard mason bee. And those have been naturalized in most ecosystems. They are likely in Southern California. I haven't looked that up myself, but you would just want to make sure that they're already naturalized. So you're not like introducing a new species into the system. Um, but yeah, there's like, those are the two that come to mind. But I think there's like five um, solitary bee species that you can order on the internet. Miss D2, I'll add um, a resource in our resources, a couple of different options in Ventura of where you can buy it. I know we have a lot of different insectaries with a lot of cool, um, just different bugs in general. So I'll add that into our resource. Um, it'll, it'll be there, but I'll also send you an email when, when I compile all that together. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. And I can send you some website links if you guys want to learn more about pollinators. Yes. Cool. <laughs> Can I just ask a question? Um, they put in a new portable at my school, at Camarillo High School. And when I came into the classroom, there were about, I don't know, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but let's say 500 bees, dead bees in the window, in the inside the window seal with the window closed and then all throughout the outside of the window. What happened there? What do you think that hmm. caused that? Do you, do you know if they were honeybees? Or, or if they were some it, other kind of bee? It looked like a, a, like a, a normal honeybee, yes. Okay, um, uh, it's really hard to say, um, but you know, if, if there was like something sugary, like a sugar water that was like colored, the what sometimes honeybees can do is if they find like a really good resource, so like they find this amazing patch of flowers, they'll go back to their um, hive and do this little dance that tells all of their friends like, hey, I found a really great resource. So like it could have been that that they found some resource that they thought was great and like told their friends to go check it out and then they somehow got stuck. Um, but that's kind of the only thing that I can think of that they were like attracted to something inside and they told a bunch of other honeybees that it was super good and they were all trying to get inside. Oh, okay. And then they got trapped. They got trapped. But yeah, it's hard to say, yeah. We have two more questions. Uh, one is which flowers attract bees the most and do all types of bees do these dances you're talking about? Just honeybees. So, you know, as much as like, you know, they're an invasive species and blah, 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 and they're hard to manage, they are incredible. <laughs> For, for the things that they do socially. They're, they're, they're really amazing creatures. So it's only honeybees that do their waggle dance. Um, they are unique in that. Um, and then what types of flowers attract bees? Um, a lot of different kinds. Um, and I would definitely go with like native flowers to your area. So you're not like introducing um, a non-native species, um, but a lot of kind of like daisy flowers are a really good source. So like if you think of um, like a sunflower or something like that, those are great pollen sources. Um, and then if you want to attract bumblebees, um, shoot, I can only think of the Latin names. Um, kind of a, a lot of like purple and blue flowers is what a lot of bees are attracted to. Um, and then um, do you guys know like what legume flowers look like? Like bean, bean flowers? Um, they have like a very uh, unique look to them. Um, and, and, and bees are great at opening those up and they really like them and they're great protein pollen sources. Um, so Alex just asked a question. Do you know some of the native flowers for Ventura County? So um, Alex is over at Rancho Campana and Alex, actually all around the garden there, all those plants, all those bushes, those are all native plants. So what's cool about that garden in particular is when they landscaped the school, they like landscaped it with um, native plants in mind. So your school actually has like the most amount of native plants on campus. And what's really nice is it's surrounding your garden. So that means like whatever um, crops we grow there too, 
we'll have a ton of different pollinators coming into it, which is awesome. And we can always, always plant more um, when we come back and do our garden clubs on campus. So yes. And then at each school site, what we try to do is um, add those native plants. So we work with fish and wildlife um, and they donate them. So we've done that over at Oxnard right now. Um, the perimeter of our Oxnard garden has a bunch of native plants. Over at Pacifica, we've done that. Um, we still need to do that. Actually at Camarillo, the Green Club, Hi Marina, they put in a, um, a whole native garden at the front of campus. And so each school site has done a really cool job of adding those areas to their campus. And so we we can continue to keep pushing that and adding those everywhere though. I think it'd be cool to add a new little native garden patch every year some, somewhere, you know? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what, what will help bring in native beets for sure. Does anyone have any uh, last, we have about 10 minutes left. Does anyone else have any questions for Amelia either on um, like how she got into schooling, pollinators, or her research, or what it's like to be a PhD candidate? I came in just a little late. Sorry about that. My class ran a little slow. Um, do you have a website where we could go look at all this information? Um, well, so you mean like pollinator information or like information about what I'm doing for my, my research? What you do for your research. Yeah, so I mean, um, I can do a link to um, my school's, like my name on my school's webpage. Um, so I'll, I'll give that to Anna to hand out. And then if you guys have any questions about like, um, my dog's having a dream. Uh, if you have any questions about um, getting into college or like looking for, if you're interested in environmental programs or anything like that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give on in my email too. And so also with that in our Google Classroom, under our, um, it'll be under our materials and we'll have pollinators. So check back tomorrow too. I'm gonna put, I'll connect with Amelia and we'll put all the resources in there. So you can go through, you can rewatch this video if you wanted to check out the first part of it. And then um, I'll have Amelia's contact info. So if anyone has questions, they can reach out and, and ask for questions too. And then it said, how, uh, Zoe said, how did you get to be able to study outside? Like, what are the steps? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, the, the first step was, was figuring out like what school to go to. So I really wanted to go to a school to make sure that like they had a lot of options for, for field science. Um, and there are a lot of schools that do that, especially in California. Um, but Humboldt State is really great for that. So when you're school shopping, make sure that, you know, if they have environmental classes that you get to go outside. Um, and that maybe the school that you go to has places that you can go outside nearby. Um, and then if you're interested in research and you want to do research outside, um, I recommend talking to any professors or teachers. So like even talking to Anna, you know, she, she works outside. Um, so, so talking to people that work outside um, and asking them, you know, like how they got their job and, and if they can write you letters of recommendation or if you can work with them a little bit. Um, yeah, so I, I found a professor that studied bees and he helped me find more professors that study bees and that's how I got to the research that I'm doing right now. But also, whenever you become an undergraduate, um, there is a program called Research Experience for Undergraduates and it's a National Science Foundation um, program. And there's tons of these programs so you get paid and you get to spend an entire summer doing research outside. Um, so, so once you go to college, I highly recommend looking into that because you can do it every single summer. Um, and, and it's really fun. And then, and then for sure, if you wanted to go on from there, people, people love that experience. Is that, Amelia, any school? So like, it, it doesn't matter what college they go to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and uh, like, okay. Yeah, and actually, so um, they, they generally will prioritize students that go to a college that maybe they can't get into research at their college, like it's a smaller college that doesn't conduct a lot of research. Um, they'll prioritize those students to getting into the program. And what's it called again? Research through the National yeah. Science Foundation, right? Yeah, it's Research okay. Experience for Undergraduates. Sure. Yeah, and then, yeah, so um, you guys do live in Ventura County, so if you want to start volunteering, I highly recommend checking out Tree People. 
Um, cause you can, you can be outside every weekend messing around with plants and digging in the dirt or, you know, help out on in the garden. <laughs> oh, you have a question about your PhD program. Mm -hmm. How's oh, it going? Uh, oh yeah. The plant biology and conservation program at Northwestern. Yeah. And I think Anna put a link to, um, my webpage a little bit up. So if you clicked on that, you could find out all the information you ever wanted to know about the program. But you can also, if you have specific questions, you can, you can email me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. They, they, they really love like connecting with communities and groups. So three people, sorry, I was still going through the comments. I should have referenced that. But yeah, if any of you think of any like questions down the road or even like in a few months when like you're figuring out, I don't know what, what year you guys are um, or anything like that. But if you ever have questions in the future, whether it's like a month from now or a year and a half from now, feel free to email me because I'll still be in my PhD program and I'll still be able to help. Um, and yes, daily tree people is available for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like you, if you are under 18, you might have to get something signed, but you don't necessarily have to be with an adult the whole time if you want to go volunteer. Yeah, and you can become a volunteer supervisor too. So if you really like going and you want to go every weekend, you can become, you can go through this like really short training and you get to wear a really cool t-shirt and you get a name tag and then you pretty much get to like lead groups of volunteers and teach them how to do the plantings. Amelia was actually a volunteer of the year awardee at Tree People, you guys. Two years in a row. Two years in a row. <laughs> bravo, bravo. <laughs> yeah, I, I really love that organization. It's, it's a lot of fun. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Amelia, and sharing all of your wisdom that you've acquired. And I learned a lot today. And I think everybody else did too. So we will add this recording to our Google Classroom. And I'll, again, I'll like make resource sheets. So that way um, we can get you in contact with Amelia if you'd like to. And we'll keep, we'll keep going. Our next uh, talk will be in about two weeks, I think. Yeah, thank you guys all for coming. It was so nice to hear from you all and talk about pollinators. Let me, let me know if you have any other burning questions. Uh, through email or something, but <laughs> cool. Amelia, thank you so much, Amelia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bye, everybody. Oh, uh, let me get the. Do you know what the next food revolution topic is? Um, I am not sure what it is. Is there anything that you're interested in discussing, Alex? We were thinking about food waste and composting. Um, so that's what we're thinking about. Okay. We have a few ideas. We also have like sustainable agriculture, but if you guys have options, if you guys have ideas, um, just tell us and we'll put it together for topics. Okay. Yeah, everybody loves compost. Um, I'm gonna look for the Google code and type it in the chat. Um, I have it right here. And if you wanna type it as I can read it to you, it's, H3HNW3T. Boom, teamwork. Perfect. All right, well, thank you. Oh, cover crops. Okay. Regenerative farming. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. All right, we have great ideas. Thank you, everybody. All right. Till Thanks. next time. Bye, thank you, Amelia. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining. Good to see you again. <laughs> it's been a while. I know. Uh, we miss you. Me too. Okay, thank you. Bye. Hi, Anna.